doesn't Seb, somehow she relays that or oh no he says that he says they want me to come inside now or they're they're making me go inside which to me i pictured them like just having to drag him inside and shut the door hi buddy hi, rob says hi hi rob <laughs> um hey buddy where's daddy Okay. I go with Debbie's with Dad. Well, later you can go to Debbie's with Dad, okay? But right now... I did. I did. You did? Yeah. Okay. Well, Mama is still podcasting with Rob right now. So can you go downstairs and find Daddy? Or what are you up here for? I... What do you need? I need to be with you. Welcome to the 42 Podcast, where we discuss life together, looking for answers to life, the universe, and, well, everything else. Here are your hosts, Rob and Lindsay. (laughs) Hello. Good morning, Lindsay. It's book club. It is book club, and uh, you finished the book. Yeah, I finished it Thursday. When did you start reading it? I started it on June 8th, (laughs) and I finished it on August 11th. All right, so I have to ask, and I'm pretty sure I know the assumption to this, but you didn't just, like, start it like, oh, I read page one, and then in the past week, cram the whole book. No. You've been reading this. I've been reading it since June Yeah, I mean, we've had a couple conversations. It was a big book yeah and it's not the kind of book i would i could read at bedtime or like at night so i read it in the morning or not at all so like Hmm. an hour here or an hour there a day or something and then sometimes i just didn't feel like reading it so there'd be like a day or two where i didn't read it because i just (laughs) wanted to read other things too because i can't help myself i'm getting into stephen king again so i've been reading a lot of stephen king and Anne Rice, which I've never read Anne Rice. But anyway, so I think we should say right off the bat that this is a spoiler show. So we are going to be talking in explicit detail, maybe, about this Mm -hmm. book. And it's really not the kind of book that you want to have spoiled for you. Because a lot of the fun of the book is figuring out how humanity survives what it survives. So... This isn't the episode to watch if you are going to read this book. Yeah. (laughs) So, having said that, it was a very big book, but I, I liked it. I liked it. So I'm not mad at you. (laughs) I'm not mad. And it didn't upset me. It's just a big, intense book. Yeah, this isn't Jesus and John Wayne again. And yeah, it was just, I think I would call this hard science fiction yes that would be accurate and 2022 is apparently the year of rob picking tough books (laughs) it was good it's just (laughs) i i've never read hard science fiction before but i get what you would like about it because a lot of the narrative was interspersed with not pro not it was prose but it wasn't narrative it was like technical aspects of the science of how how things are happening or how things are made or how things could possibly happen and that was hard for me because it would be very interesting narrative people stories characters and then it would sort of stop doing that and be very much about the technical aspects for like a long time like three pages or four pages or more and um and I I didn't skip anything I didn't skip a thing. Um, And some of that was hard to get through. But thankfully, I read it on my Kindle so I could look up hard words because there was a lot of hard words. Yes. And I had to look up like probably 12 or 15 words in this book. You know, some words you can kind of guess what they mean based on the context. Right. But no. Okay. 
Well, you listened to it, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I would listen to that when I was driving, or... If I sit there and I'm doing receipts, which July was a big receipt month for me at work, so I'll sit there and I'll put that in and then do all my receipt work. Stuff like that. I tr- I got the audiobook too, and I couldn't listen to it. It was too hard to listen. It was too hard to understand. I had really? to look at it. Yes. The technical hmm. stuff, I zoned out. Actually, the reader wasn't very good. That was part of it. I didn't like her voice. I didn't like the way she read things. So I would just I would just tune her out. And it was very technical, and I couldn't picture what she was saying just listening to it. I had to see the words to picture what she was saying. So I didn't listen to hardly at all. I'm sure Colby will love it. So he can listen to it, too. It wasn't a total waste of money, but... <laughs> Okay, so you, <laughs> now you got me thinking of, okay, who, because I listened to it, but I don't remember a female reader. I think there's a British reader, too. Yeah, there, there's two. It's Mary uh, Robinette Kowal, Kowal? I don't know how to pronounce that, and Will Dameron. <sighs> yeah, she, I didn't like her. She wasn't very good. Oh, I didn't mind her. Okay, so... You had to look up a lot of words. Yes. Overall, it's not a bad book, but not like a I'm going to reread this ever book. Okay. Hey, that's okay. You're allowed to not like a book. I mean, I I didn't hate it. (laughs) And I didn't even like not like it per se. It was just harder to read than I would have probably picked for myself so i probably wouldn't have finished it just because of the harder parts where i'm like meh i don't really care exactly (laughs) it was a good experience that's the whole point of book club is reading something reading something you might not read by yourself but watching your face as you're trying to describe what you're thinking and feeling with the book i mean it, it there's kind of a bit of a war going on there and it's funny yeah (laughs) <laughs> I liked okay. I liked the characters a lot. I liked the characters. I liked the interpersonal stuff. I really liked uh well, I don't know how you want to This is such a big book. I don't even know how you want to talk about it, but I liked Tekla the Russian. We'll, we'll get into that in a a minute. But just sitting with this is like your general review. This is you reacting to the book. Yeah. And your end review is meh. Yeah. Okay. So I I enjoyed it. I this is the second time I've read it. Destin Sandlin from Smarter Every Day he talked about it a while ago, and that's why I was like, "Ooh, I I'm curious. I'll pick it up." I enjoyed the book. I thought it was a good read. I love this. I love hard science stuff. Mm-hmm. Even when I don't know it, I'm like, "Ooh, let's you know." I'll open a Wikipedia page and. That's not the source of knowledge of all things, but it's a good way to get a good an overview. Yeah. And uh, so I have fun with stuff like that. Second time reading it, I, I still enjoyed it. I don't think this is one that I'll be like, yay, yearly read, but I'll probably read it once or twice more mm-hmm. eventually. So, I don't know. I thought it was good. Mm. Mm-hmm. I've enjoyed it. I give it three stars on Goodreads. Yeah, I did see your notes and all of that yesterday. Oh, yeah. They popped up on, on the Goodreads of, hey, your friend did this thing. I still don't understand Goodreads fully. <laughs> so what are you reading now? Now I'm reading a book called The Talisman by Stephen King and Peter Straub. And it's mm. very, very good. It's sort of like... It's about a 12-year-old boy who's traveling from New Hampshire to California, and he's on a quest to save his mother. He's been taught how to travel in this alternate space, which is very king. It's called the Territories, and it's about his adventures and the people he meets, and it's horror. And you forget it's horror sometimes when you're reading it because it's about a, a kid. So you think it's a young adult book, but it's not. It's very good. I'm really enjoying it. 
the level of sci-fi that King brings into his book, books, I really like. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't understand that when you first had me read King. Mm-hmm. But I love his multiverse. Yes. I really do. Where it's, oh my gosh, this really is one of the best multiverses created. I just saw a video about that. And this guy mapped out all the books and how they interact with each other in his mm-hmm. multiverse. And it was fascinating. I'll send you a link later if you want to watch it. Um, but it's he. It's such a treat to read King. The more King you read, the more you see familiar things it's just very rewarding to see characters you've seen before, like, oh, that character's <laughs> from It, or that character's from Misery, or, oh, yeah, this place, and that character, and it's it's very cool. All right, so, we're not going to go deep in King, but I wanted to ask you what you were reading next, just kind of as a, you know, what, what's your recovery from my bad book choices? And the recovery's been all along. Like, that's why I've been reading things that are starkly <laughs> different from from this hard science fiction. I've been reading that. So, yeah. Okay. Now. Sorry. Let's talk about the book. Okay, fine. The point that I always stick with that bothers me, like it is a thorn in my side and a reason I love and hate this book. Mm -hmm. How did you feel with how they opened the book and the whole crisis and disaster? Which, by the way, the full moon was on Thursday. It's a beautiful big moon. Yeah, I saw. Have you been able to look at the moon the same since you read this book? No, definitely not. In the beginning of the book, that's how the book starts. Yeah, read the, oh, that, hold on, I'll read that first line. The moon blew up without warning and for no apparent reason. That's the first line of the book. It's like a mm-hmm. splash of cold water on your face. Like, what? And then they never answer it. Oh, they do. They try to. They, 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 they give guess. you that. Well, yeah, they guess. They give you that, okay, there was, they call it the agent. Yeah. It happened to the moon. They don't know what it is. They don't know where it came from. They don't know if it could happen again. It just happens. Yep. And that's it. That's where they leave it. It just happens. Yeah. You know, there's no breaking of the fourth wall, and you get to find out. You know what the Asian is. You know that it's whatever. There's none of that. It's just the moon blew up. Because it doesn't really... Ah, wait. I just... Oh, that was close. Hold on, I gotta kill a hornet. <laughs> you shouldn't laugh. <laughs> ah, keep it PG while you're murdering things. Ah! Freaking thing. <laughs> <laughs> I got him. <laughs> he flew into my hand, but didn't sting me. <laughs> into my hand! <laughs> I should not be laughing. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad I'm editing this week. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, Well, are you okay? Yeah, I didn't get stung. It's a miracle. It just bloop. I think it's because my hand was open. (laughs) Okay. Are are you one of those people who like, oh, bee, hornet, stingy thing, you're gone? Well, I don't want... I I wouldn't be able to see where he was. So, yeah. If I... Knew where he was, I wouldn't care so much, but I don't okay. know, and he's under my desk, and I don't want him to sting me in places you shouldn't be stung. Not that you should be stung anyway, anywhere, but... Sorry, just asking. I have known people who... Nope, B, they're gone. And they're not allergic. <sighs> what were we saying? You, you were saying, ah, I'm about to die. Hornet, hornet, hornet. Die, you son of a... Sorry. <laughs> Way to keep it mostly PG outside of... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Phew. All right. We were talking about the entirely, in my opinion, unsatisfactory element that they bring into it of the moon just explodes. Yeah. That's it. And if you've been able to look at the moon... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm still seeing hornets in my mind. <laughs> All right. Have you been able to look at the moon s- the same since? No. No, It's it was definitely pretty fascinating. And trying to picture what it would look like if it wasn't seven pieces is... Yeah. Did you notice that there were seven pieces and there were seven eaves? 
And I I did not. That's pretty good. Also, Seven Eves is a palindrome. It is. Very interesting. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, that is. I did not I didn't notice that originally it was seven pieces for the moon. But of mm-hmm. course as I think I think it was six and then it broke up or something. Oh yeah. So the moon breaks up in the story. And post moon breaking up, there's the element of Wow, yay, this is neat and different. It's not exactly like end of the world, but it turns out to be end of the world. Yes. Do you want to explain why that is? Yeah, I guess we should probably explain that. Yeah. Where the scientists of the world start being, well, scientists and going, okay, yay, this is neat. Let's understand more. And let's play with the orbital mechanics of it. And what they discover is that, yeah, the moon has broken up and it's going to continue to collide with itself and continue to break down into smaller and smaller chunks. Exponentially. Right. Until it eventually starts an event that they call the hard rain. or Well, no, it's the white sky and then the hard rain. Where the sky will just... You can still see the sun, but it will be so many meteorites or meteoroids. or I don't remember what the term is for those. But that the sky will just turn white because of that. And then a couple days later, it's just going to rain rocks and all life on Earth is going to die from either the heat or the impacts. I think it's the heat that blew my mind. That the heat from these objects going through the atmosphere and hitting Earth, the heat that the objects give off all together was enough to heat the Earth to the extent that it could not be livable. That's amazing. That's where the heat came from. What? That's that's amazing to me. A couple years back, there was that meteorite that uh, came streaking through the sky and it burst over a city effectively and blew out a bunch of windows. But also because of that, people actually got like meteorite burn. There's a whole thing. Really? Yeah, where because of the UV and the heat that it put off, people got like a bad sunburn. Wow. Who were close to. I, I got to look that up, but I'm fairly certain. Hmm. I had no idea that that that, that could happen. The... Chalabinsk, Chablinsk, Chablinsk. I think it's Chablinsk. Smashed glass, burned skin, defied expectations. And that was in 2013. Hmm. Huh. And this came out in 2015, right? 2015. Hmm. Actually, I don't remember when this came out, but yeah, I think it was after that. Yeah, and I mean, you can find YouTube videos of that that meteorite streaking through the sky. It lit everything up, and some of the people who were close. I remember the news story of some of the people who were close actually got, like, sunburns from it because of the intense heat and radiation that it put off. Not lethal radiation, but, like, UV from it. So, wow, yeah, I mean, that would be... Multiply that by thousands. Right. And you've got an atmosphere that overheats. Right. And and I don't know why. It's just that little bit, like, uh, what was the movie? Oh, Don't Look Up. Yeah, it reminded me of that several times. Right, and the piece of that is, okay, you know, there's a countdown timer, and there's this great push of, okay, we're going to try and save humanity, and we'll talk about what that looks like. But to me, there's that that great push of working to save humanity, and we're going to die. Like that dual thought of, what's the value of my work against, I am dead. Yeah. <laughs> Lindsay. And and what? Someday you will be dead. Someday I will be dead. Yeah. And theoretically, this podcast will continue to exist. Yeah. What's the value of that work? Have you ever thought of that? I think it depends who you ask. <laughs> True. But yes, okay. I've, th- I've thought of that. I have thought of that. That this might be my only legacy besides my children. Your children will be a better legacy. (laughs) I know, I know. But yes, I have thought of that. 
I would be more content to know that my children are my legacy than any other work I've ever done. Yeah. They're a pretty good legacy as it stands. But that mortal aspect of things, just, I don't know. How, how do you feel sitting with that aspect of it? Just mortality, life. It makes me a little queasy. Okay. That, that's part of the fascination of it for me because there's, there's just that, that queasiness, if you will. That is a good word for it. I feel like nervous. I feel like when you know you have to give a speech or something, but you're not ready. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like thinking about that. Hmm. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I don't mind talking about it. It's just not something. It's when I think about it, it it is scary. It it is it is because it's it's what we will face alone. But all right, out moving out of the existential. <laughs> yeah. How did you feel with the the efforts and the science that they were doing of? building the hope that would continue. I thought it was interesting that everybody, I mean, as far as we know, because it, do, it does mostly focus on scientists. It doesn't really talk about normal folks, except for how they relate to these scientists on the International Space Station, which is nicknamed in the book Izzy. Um, so it talks about normal people through them because they have boyfriends or girlfriends or what have you. But... I found it interesting the attempts to keep order on Earth, even though everyone knew that it was all going to end. Yeah. And that only certain people were going to live. And for the most part, except for the business with Venezuela, the riots and stuff that happened there, it seemed like people accepted that. Well, now, how did you feel with what happened in Venezuela? With that whole little bit of arc that they gave, which plays out in a bigger way, kind of emotionally. Yeah, yeah, with, um... Julie. Julie, yeah, it did, because it has to do with her character, I think, for sure. But, so there was riots happening in Venezuela because the people there... What, what were they fighting about? Um, I can't remember. They didn't feel like they had enough representation on the cloud arc. The cloud arc being the, the science that they had figured out to give humanity their best chance of survival in space. Yeah, so there was like a a lottery, supposedly a lottery. Right. And people from different countries got two people to go to represent them on the cloud arc, supposedly. Didn't really end up happening that way, ultimately. But so the Venezuelans were upset that they didn't have representation. The percentage was lower for them, not overall, but and they covered that in the book early on, where there there's a bit of I don't know what to call it, genderism and prioritization of okay, it's not the guys we need. Yeah. The, the guy's end of things that is in procreation and continued existence, that can be stuck in a refrigerator and, yeah. you know, we're all good. You ne they needed women. Yeah. So the prioritization was young women. And then the second half of that prioritization was kind of by gamble of the, the best and the brightest. Yeah, so it wasn't a true lottery. Right. It was every country was given like a set number of people that they could do and they were all in their 20 or, you know, teens and 20s and sent to camps to train to be in space and then launched up in a, it's basically a pop can, a soda can that they lived in and would occasionally join with the main arc that was the former United or the International Space Station, Izzy. Mm -hmm. And Certain countries started feeling misrepresented, and then suddenly, whoops, somebody launched a nuke. Yeah. So, I think the thought was, well, that stinks, it's violent and terrible, but I think the justification of it was, they're all going to die anyway really soon. So, maybe it doesn't matter. I think that was how they lived with it, anyway. 
But even then, man, I mean, that's that's harsh. Well, it is. You're going to die, so I'm going to kill you. I, crazy mm, town. Well, it is crazy town, yes. And, and they get into that. Julia. Julia Bliss. I, I really want to talk about that. But they get into Pictured that. Pictured her as Meryl Streep the whole time. Re- well, yeah. Because thank- she was just, she just was just like that to me. Just like that. Like, oh, she aggravated me so much. Because she, so there was a rule on the Cloud Arc that politicians were not allowed up there. People who represented these two different countries weren't allowed to be in the lottery. They couldn't go up. And she, at the very, 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 very end, like the earth is, what is the, what, is, what does it, it tips over. Yeah, there's the white sky event. And then it's the hard rain. And then it's a hard rain. So, like, white sky happens, and then you have, like, a day or two. That's it. Where it's, okay, white sky has happened. This is it. The next thing that and happens. And it's a chain reaction. Right. It yeah. just... And the end result is, at, at in 10,000 years, the Earth will have a new set of rings. But first, yep. we're going to get all the meteorites that aren't going to be rings and impacting on Earth, and it's going to become uninhabitable. Right. So, right before... I mean, total destruction of the Earth, somehow she manages to escape. Right. And she escapes in, uh, I think they said it was the X-37, which is an experimental military plane, not plane, spacecraft that may or may not be circling Earth in ways that are very still mysterious and funny and goofy and people watch it. Huh. It's a thing. Actually, I think there's an X-37 that's been up there for like three years now. With a person in it? Nope. They just launch it. It looks like a miniaturized space shuttle, and it's just up there. So she's... Okay, so they they had to be in a suit. They couldn't just be in there. So the when it was written, part of the concept is that the X-37 would be bigger, but it could ho- hold people and... Right, right, right. Yeah, so... So she sneaks up on there with other people, but they, in, but they don't make it. It's just her... And it's this big thing because basically she's breaking the law. Right. She's breaking the law by being there. But now here's the question. And this this is a neat part of the book. This is when I start kind of replugging in in a different way. So it, everything that happens up to the hard rain, there's an emotional connection that you're dealing with because you're you're dealing with characters who are about to die. Yeah. Actually, I mean, through the whole book, almost everybody, well, everybody dies, which yeah. is a very... Like, you you want there to be a happy ending, but everybody dies. Yeah. Eventually. <laughs> but that's what this book is sitting with. Everybody dies. I mean, that's, that's like, uncomfortable as a book. We'll come back well, to yeah, that. Yeah, because it jumps 5,000 years. Well, so, shh. So, oh, uh, you just jumped it. <laughs> no, what I'm saying, that's how everybody dies, because it jumps 5,000 years. So it doesn't necessarily kill off everybody, like, violently, but... Everybody dies. Yeah, but everybody dies because And, and you're sitting time. with that. <laughs> well, not just time, but anyway, all right. Anyway, she breaks the law, ends up on this shuttle thingy, and uh, they have to decide what to do with her. Right. Now, kind of with that point, I mean, you're sitting with, she's the one who authorized the nuking of Venezuela. She's been this chaotic character, which, by the way, you think of Meryl Streep. I think of Elaine from Seinfeld. <laughs> well, and they forgot to deliver your paper today. Why don't you uh, just grab that one? Th- that belongs to Mr. Potato Guy. That's his. Come on, I get it. <laughs> well, if you want it, you get it. Sorry, thou shalt not steal. <laughs> oh, but it's okay for me. Oh, what do you care? You know where you're going. <laughs> All right, that is it. I can't live like this. Uh, no. Come on! All right, what did I do? (laughs) David, I'm going to hell! The worst place in the world! With devils and those those caves and and the ragged clothing! (laughs) And the heat! My God, the heat! (laughs) What do you think about all that? It's gonna be rough. (laughs) You should be trying to save me! Don't boss me! This is why you're going to hell! I am not going to hell! And if you think I'm going to hell, you should care that I'm going to hell, even though I am not. You stole my Jesus fish, didn't you? Yeah, that's right! 
What? I, that's th- hilarious. That's what I think of. Huh. Or <laughs> I think of, if you've ever watched it, Iron Sky. Mm-mm. It It's like a weird, goofy B movie that it's just, it's weird. It's really weird. And they have a female president who's a spoof on Sarah, Sarah Palin. So I, between those two. <clears throat> I think that was my favorite part of the book, though, was that was the point from the the, hard, the building the of the hard cl- rain happens. OK. And until it skips, you know, until Dina, they, they find the trench in the moon and they just sort of camp there. That's my favorite part of the book. I like that well, the best. It is because that's the one where you're dealing with a lot of the relationship building, a lot of the social and dynamic tensions of people in space yeah getting to the hard rain is a lot of science it's a lot of establishing some characters why we need to do this and by the way a lot of these people are dead and i think i liked that part too with tekla um the russian yes. cosmonaut who ends up there um how she how dina rescues her and uh how cool she is she's super cool i loved her and and that is one of the neat things that we should probably talk about where in that first pass of okay we need to turn the international space station into this arc that was that was interesting they that send, was very interesting they send cosmonauts on suicide missions yeah here's your space suit you're gonna live in this and you'll probably be dead in a month and they're all like okay sorry cool and I love that information they give about Tekla. Like, oh, yeah, and she was a former Olympian and a model, and she's really pretty, and she's tough. Like, I love all that information. <laughs> and and Tekla is a neat character. She is. Yeah, she was super cool. I really liked her a lot. Yeah. I liked her. I liked Dina. I liked Moira. I liked Ivy. But I'm supposed to. I think you're supposed to like all them. You are. You know, it, <laughs> the book is called Seven Eves. Yeah. And you, you're starting to be introduced to some of those characters who you're like, oh, okay, I like, I like that character. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, I hope this is one of the seven Eves. But Did you know that's how it was going to go? Did you know that's what it meant? I had a suspicion that as soon as they were like, hey, the earth or the moon blew up and, it, you know, from that point it was, oh, okay, so this is going to be something where there are seven women and I don't know what that's going to entail. So seven women yeah. will be important somehow. And yeah. then when they started kind of, you know, leading you to that second part of the book. Whittling down the population by right. hundreds. <laughs> yeah. Or billions. Where it's okay. Most yeah, of the yeah. people on Earth are now dead. Okay. So now we're dealing with all the people in space. Hey. Yeah. They seem to be disposable too. I think I had a hard time keeping the scope of things in my head at that point. Um, after the hard rain and they're all and there's arclets and little pods where people live. I could not keep the size of it in my head because they'd say things like, oh, 300 people died. I'm like, there was 300 people up there. There was like a thousand people up there at one point. More than right. That. So the, I don't understand. I can't picture that in my head at all. But speaking of picturing it. Ron Howard is going to be directing this movie. Really? Yes. It's a, it, it has a page on Internet Movie Database. There's a writer. There's two writers, obviously, Neil Stevenson and another guy. And Ron Howard is listed as the director. But there's no date attached to it yet. So I think it's... I don't even know if they're f- filming it yet. But it's it's got its own page. Anyway. You'd have to do Ron this Howard. and... It would have to be a trilogy. I heard that um, before Neil Anderson, I I always want to call him Anderson. Before Neil Stevenson wrote this book, he had written it as a movie and a TV show first, but nobody picked it up or something. So he so he wrote the book. So by the time he wrote the book, he'd already really developed the world, and he said it was the fastest book he's ever written. Uh, I guess you could do it as two. This is the fastest book he ever wrote? Wow. He wrote it quickly, he said. Because he'd already thought about it, I guess. He already kind of knew what was going to happen. It was a big book. 
Yeah. I mean, it, okay, so there are three sections of the book. There's everything up to the hard rain, so Earth is still there. And then there's after the hard rain, which is everything on the cloud arc, and what happens with that. And then there's the time jump, a couple thousand years in the future. If they were going to do a movie, they could maybe get away with two if they focused hard rain and then cloud arc. And then at the end of that, just did the time jump to say, yay, happy ending. Yeah, that, th- that last part needs its own movie because it was so involved. And and I had to look up this stuff. I, I tried to look online for pictures because I could not really picture in my head what he was saying, which is kind of the reason I had a hard time with the book was because I couldn't understand. We'll, we'll come back to that, all right? But anyway, so... <laughs> trying to keep us focused. We're kind of meandering, but that's okay. Hmm. Now I'm stuck on that movie bit, though. And I also don't know how I feel about Ron Howard right now. Why? I don't know anything. <laughs> Episode 8. He did, a, he did Apollo 13. I know he did Apollo 13, and Apollo 13 was amazing. But he also did Star Wars Episode Eight, which is a phenomenal movie in its own right. It just feels weird. So I don't know how I feel about Ron Howard. I think he's still a good director. I'm not disagreeing. But maybe Bryce Dallas Howard should do it. I hope I hope she's involved. Oh, she's yeah. She's been involved in a lot of his projects recently. And yeah. she's phenomenal. So Either as an actor or... Which, by the way, I one minor complaint. Oh, shoot. I don't remember which Spider-Man it is. I think it's Spider-Man 3. The Sam Raimi Spider-Man, Spider-Man 3. Where you have Gwen Stacy... Yeah, it's Spider-Man 3. Gwen Stacy is played by Bryce Dallas Howard, who's yep. a redhead. Mm-hmm. And you have Mary Jane, played by Kirsten Dunst, who's a blonde. They entirely mix that up. Gwen Stacy's always a blonde. And Come on. Sorry. Minor aggravation. Minor <laughs> rabbit trailing. I'm done. I'm done. All right. So, back to the book. <laughs> but yes, you, you get that. The hard rain happens. Julian escapes as the only politician who does that it's kind of looked at cowardly there's they introduced Chekhov's gun I love how they introduce that you you know what I mean by Chekhov's gun yeah okay you introduce a gun in act one it has to be used in act two they do that with Julie and that whole moment where they're like oh we need to go and whatever this thing is that's flying around save it and then they open the airlock to it and realize it's Julie in my head, I'm screaming, shut the airlock, space the thing. Just, yeah. no, no, no. And and what do they do? Oh, we're going to save her. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. they, they build that character to be kind of despisable. Despicable. Despicable. Well, despicable me doesn't know what despisable, despicable, disposable <laughs> mean. Yeah, she's pretty. Dis- she is despicable. She is. She is. She is. And she's wheedling and manipulative, and always looking, always causing trouble between people. And if there is no trouble, she creates trouble. Not only that, but she's like, "Oh, that sounds like a great idea. You should go and do it and die." Like that's what I hear every time. Where it's that's all she does is she sends people to their death. Yeah through inaction (laughs) and i i love the fact that she gets on there everything had been fine relationally basically up there until she got there then she's there and everybody's like all the scientists who are all semi-autistic and and that's even said Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's a quote from the book and um they're all looking at each other like what is happening right now (laughs) because she because they don't even know really what to do with her except for like Marcus, the Marcus character is, he's the one who's instituted um, martial law basically up there because right. there is no more, there is no constitution anymore. There is no United States. None of that exists. So they all have to figure out 
what the law is. And he kind of has to do that. Right. And, you know, right as you're getting and dealing with that, the hard rain, there's martial law there. There's a whole social dynamic that's only beginning to unpack itself. You find out that uh, a piece of the story that happens early on that at this point you have forgotten about of, hey, this far-fetched mission went out to get a comet because we're going to need water in space to either make fuel or to I live on. I loved that guy. Well, that guy died. Sean, horribly. I know he did. I know he did. And I loved that. I loved him. He was my, he was Elon Musk in my head. <laughs> Oy. Sean something. Yeah, Sean. I don't remember. I re but really liked that guy. Yeah, he. so they introduced this eccentric billionaire who has a space company, and he flies up early on in the book and is like, hey. To get Emir. Right. He's like, hey, uh, we're putting together this mission. We're going to go to the furthest point in space that we can, and uh, we're going to nuke a, a comet, get a chunk of ice, and fly it back to Earth. And so there's this little bit of drama that plays out with all of that. And you're like, oh, okay, neat. Was it to Earth or was it back to Izzy already? Did they already well, know it was coming back to Izzy? It, he knew it was coming back to Izzy. It was just you had to get into yeah. Earth orbit. Because yeah, Izzy yeah. was still in Earth orbit. So yeah. That was a good part of the book. It, it was. And the thing I love is that at the point that, you know, everything happens... They've just kind of left that hanging loose, and suddenly it's introduced in a way, and you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot. There was yeah. that whole bit in the beginning of the book. And they introduce, reintroduce that, you know, as the crisis of the hard rain is happening, as everyone is grieving and dealing with yes, my family's that's right. Because that's you right. also have Diane. Like, if you're... No. Yeah. Dina. Dina. Sorry. Dina. Who is dealing with she would communicate with her father through through Morse code uh, that and was so sad but that was that was a good piece of the story because you have her who's communicating yeah. with her father as the hard rain is beginning and he's sitting out hiding in his truck as he and his family and his close friends and, and connections had built a deep underground mountain shelter and he's mm -hmm. sitting out in the truck as everything's starting to burn. He's like, yeah, I love you, miss you, da-da-da-da-da-da. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're dealing with that, which, you know, humanized and it, brought the crisis it, to. He basically has to get dragged in, you know? Like, they drag him inside the she, mountain because he just wants to keep talking to her. Yeah, and uh, now that's a speculative that. as to what happens. But doesn't... Somehow she relays that, or... Oh no, he says that. He says they want me to come inside now or yeah. they're they're making me go inside, which to me I pictured them like just having to drag him inside and shut the door. Hi buddy. Hello, kiddo. Rob, Rob says hi. Hi. You got a haircut. Hi, Rob. <laughs> um, hey buddy. Where's daddy? Hi daddy. I go with Debbie's Dad. Well, later you can go to Debbie's with Dad, okay? But right now... I did. I did. You did? Yeah. Okay. Well, Mama is still podcasting with Rob right now. So can you go downstairs and find Daddy? Or what are you up here for? I... What do you need? I need to be with you. <laughs> you can't be with me. <laughs> no, I have to podcast. Okay? I'll be downstairs in a few minutes. Can we acknowledge that that is the sweetest thing that has ever been said in this podcast? Yeah. I mean... He's the cutest. I just want to be with you. Full stop. Yep. Yeah, no. <sighs> yeah. Sweet kid. He's just... He does the most ridiculous things. He does the most ridiculous things. He's so cute, but... Oh, my goodness. Then yesterday, I was on the porch... I'm sorry. We'll get back to that in a second. <laughs> I was on the porch, and... He comes in, sits next to me with his hands folded in his lap, and he says, I put my shoe in the fridge. <laughs> I said, okay. Whoa. Well, your shoe doesn't belong in the fridge. Can you go get it? And he's like, okay, I put my flip-flop in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> Did he have a reasoning for it? No. He just wanted cold feet? Yeah, I guess. Y you know what you should do? <laughs> Literally? When he gets R married? Yeah. Like, wedding day, take a shoe, stick them in the fridge. 
<laughs> Just wanted to make sure you had cold feet for your wedding. <laughs> Love, Mom. Yeah, he's oh, so man. funny. He's so funny. My my poor kid spouses, the ways I will lovingly just poke. Torment them. Yeah. yeah. Lovingly. Lovingly. Yeah. Dad jokes galore. But all right, anyway, back to seven Sorry. years. Hmm. But yes. So they introduce Sean, they reintroduce the comment. So you've got all these like crises stacking up on each other. Just bam, 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 bam. And they want to make it so that it's big. It's panicky. And then they introduce that social dynamic with Julie that yeah. now there's yeah. like, hey, we're going to go to Mars. No, we're not going to go to Mars. Hey, we're going to do this. Hey, we're going to. Ah. Yeah. Oh, that was awesome. I loved that. I loved that whole part. I think that's my favorite part of the book. All that stuff with, okay, we got Amir coming back with Sean and then Marcus and all that whole trip to go rescue them because they already knew Sean had died. And so what are they going to find when they get there? How are they going to get there? How are they going to bring it back? All that stuff. The trip back. Oh, that was amazing. I loved that. And I was shocked when Marcus died. I did not see that coming at all. I thought he couldn't die because he was like the leader. You can't die. You can't kill off. But he did a George R. R. Martin and totally killed him. Okay. So wait a minute. Okay. Who doesn't die? I know everybody dies, Rob. Okay. But, but you think some people. You're, you're, you you're, think you're some saying, people are so vital to the story that they can't die. They don't die. Uh, they don't die until there's five thousand years. Then yes, okay, they're dead. But Dina didn't die. Ivy didn't die. Moira didn't die. None of them died because they're essential to the party. But characters party? that you story story, but characters you do think that are essential to the plot. So like George R. R. Martin with what he does. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's just veer into this a little bit. How do you feel when a character who you have marked in your head as this is someone who's going to be a plot driver? Yeah. They can't die. How do I feel about that? Yeah. How do you feel when they just die? They're killed. Goodbye. You feel deflated. Like, uh, now you don't know what's going to happen. You're like, well, okay, so how's, who's going to be in charge now? (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. So, yes, I don't, it's surprising. It's very surprising. But do you like that surprise? Do you like that cliffhanger of there is almost no plot armor? Or do you want certain characters to No, have? no. Yeah. So I feel, right. You, I guess then you just read different. After that happens, you read it different because you savor the characters more, I guess. I was surprised when Dubois died, too. Dubois. Da, Dub. Dubois. <laughs> Dub. Yeah. Yeah. I see, Dub. I wasn't. I liked him, too. I was actually surprised uh, that they let him live as long as they did. But we'll we'll get there. We'll get there. So. But you don't like it. He was like the it. Neil deGrasse Tyson character. He, he was. But you don't like it when they kill off someone who you deem is essential, effectively. Well, do you? That's a weird thing to say. Of course I don't. I mean, I, I don't care if I if I don't like the character. I guess it would be one thing. But I really liked him. I thought he was interesting. And I thought, oh, no, what's going to happen to this mission now? Because this mission has to succeed, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, all right. So my answer is kind of twofold to that. Pre-George R. R. Martin and Game of Thrones? No, I hated it. I loathed it when that would happen. Like, first time, my first exposure to Game of Thrones was the show, and then I went back and read the books. Well, I watched the first season, then read the books. Uh, and I I was mad that first season when they killed Sean Bean's character, who I'm entirely blanking on the character's name right now. Stark. Stark. Ned. Yeah. Ned, Ned Stark. Stark. When they killed Ned Stark, no, they, this is a horrible show. This is stupid. How are they going to? And then I got it. I figured it out. When I read the books, it's not the characters. It's the story. Mm-hmm. And I started rethinking it and going, how is the story going to continue? And there will be characters who drive it, who you love, and you don't want to see die. Like, I entirely expected, I'm not disappointed, but I entirely expected uh, Tyrone Lan- Tyrion Lannister. 
dead. He's got to be dead. Got to be dead. Get, how is he not dead? But I love that because it was the story continued. And that that's what I've come to love where it's okay. I kind of like it when we're we're not overly zealous with that plot armor and we let the story exist. Knowing the story goes on even if the characters we love die. So Mark is dying in Seven Eves. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. He's not a woman. And we only get to have seven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was, it was sad. I does, and I don't think I really understood super clear until later in the story that Marcus and Dina were sleeping together. Yeah. They had a thing. Yeah. I didn't catch that very well. Um, I guess until she sort of was grieving after like oh i guess i didn't know it was that big of a thing i didn't I'm not sure cuz she her lab anytime the curtain was closed there was something going on yeah that's they they don't go into any like romantic and explicit detail with any of it it was just the curtain's closed she's sleeping with whoever's in there effectively yeah that yeah that's the mechanic they introduced for the romance side of it. Yeah. Yeah. That but, was that was sad. Oh, and that guy who um saved them basically by dying in the boiler room in that Ani mm-hmm. Mir. Who was that guy? I really liked him too. I, I was sad when he died. I don't remember. But so the Emir mission that they do to get that comet chunk, yeah, again, that's a thing where everybody but Diana Day- Dina Dina Sorry, I'm not going to get that right the rest of the show. But Dina is the only one who survives. Everybody else has to die. And again, they show that. It's a crippled ship. It's dirty, radioactive. And just the whole time, just, oop, well, they're dead. Oop, well, they're dead. Hey, yeah. they've been radi- poisoned by radioactivity, and they're slowly leaking out all their organs and dying. You know, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yucky. Yeah. So I appreciate that because, again, it's accelerating the pace of the story because when they get it back is when the split happens. Because Julie has gotten her group of people who are like, yeah, we're going to go to Mars and we're going to abandon you. So they take a bunch of the little cloud arclets and fly into a different orbit. And then you have the Izzy crew who now has the the comet that I'm forgetting. Emir? What did they call the comet? The, right, the one that they went and got was Emir, and then the one that was already on Izzy at the beginning of the story was Amalthea. Yeah, and that was just a giant meteorite, or space rock, yes. That yeah. they were mining. They couldn't have survived without that. Yeah. Right, and they were mining that and, you know, seeing if they could get iron and that was pre hard rain and all of that but yes and so now you have the two divisions of people you have the the pirate arklets we'll call them and the the easy people and they're trying to yeah. survive in space and we kind of do a, a quick time jump because the a couple years yeah, right just 2 years or something something like that because they're trying to get into a higher orbit and they're using the the comet core to fuel and mine and protect the ship and yep uh, get to a safe orbit so that they can actually get to some of the bigger chunks of the moon. One of them's an iron core that they can live on. Mm-hmm. How did you feel when they brought the two arc li- or arc groups back together? Because that's that was crazy. <laughs> uh, what was her name? You listened to the book, and so maybe you can pronounce her name. Is it Anita? Anita. I think it was. Is that her Anita. name? Anita. I think. Anita. Look, I can't even say. Dana. <laughs> yeah, I can't even say that correct. So you want me to get another name correct? But you listened to the book. I, but she was, she was freaky. She was freaky. She was. But introducing her... Ida. Was... I who? don't know. Aida. Ida. Yeah, I think you're right. Aida. Ida. Intr- introducing her was a very good idea for the story because it made Julia seem a lot tamer. <laughs> right. And I actually, when they reintroduced Julia in that, we'll get to that. I was really happy because I was like, yay, somebody figured it out. But 
So they brought figured it out. I'll I'll get to that. All right. So they brought the two groups back together, and you what you find out in the whole thing because as the as the arklets are coming back to Izzy, you know it's under the pretense of we've got like twelve people left. Izzy's got like twenty people left. Humanity's down to thirty two people, roughly. And we're starving. Yeah. Yeah, we're starving. By the way, we kind of took on cannibalism from the arklets. Well, Izzy has been able to scrape by on LG substitute or something like that. I... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was LG. That was it. Because they were doing LG in the water tanks and using that to survive. So you feel kind of queasy and uneasy about that, especially as they're reintroducing everyone. And you're like, oh, no, they're going to eat my leg. Because the one <laughs> journalist who had been up there running a space blog is like, hey, I'm going to cut my leg off and I'm going to eat it. And, like, they lay that out and, and how that was the beginning of cannibalism there. And the way she explains it, the because the, they're, they're FaceTiming. Space time or whatever they call, call yeah. it. Yeah. With with this woman before they decide if they're going to let her, let them back together, like, get the, get the crew back together. Because it's a sort of a feat, a dangerous feat to rejoin the two groups. And she's just very matter-of-factly, well, they, upon questioning... What have you been eating then? We've been eating each other. And she says that that journalist cuts his own leg off. But later on, uh, Julius says that, well, no, they cut his leg off and made him eat it. Right. They did that right before they docked. They killed him, ate him so that they would have strength and be able to attack Izzy and take over Izzy and, you know, be the dominant force. And they're now reintroducing the gun again that Julie brought up. Yeah. Because that gun has kind of been floating around. It got used once before in the middle of the story. And, you know, now here it is again. <sighs> yeah. That was so frustrating. I felt so, like, uh, after all this, all this work you guys have done, so many years, so much money, and now it's all going to shit because... Because of these crazy people, these crazy cannibal people. And I loved how he played with that taboo and made it like, nope, you will, you will never be accepted again. Oh, you yeah, will never be either. accepted. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Now, once they reintroduce that, once that whole moment settles, because when that moment settles, almost everybody's dead. There's like nine people left. Uh, and they reintroduce Julie at this point. Who has been on the other cloud on the cloud arcs that broke away and Yeah. When they reintroduce her, they pierced <laughs> her tongue, stuck a bolt through her tongue so she couldn't speak or use it anymore. How symbolic is that? Because it was just nope, we're not dealing with this anymore. <laughs> yeah. And I Go ahead. Well, I immediately felt bad for her and, and, and felt like she must have learned her lesson. Like, I felt like this had taught her a lesson. That's how I felt. This punishment and look at look at what your decisions have done to you. See, yeah. you're not that smart. You're not, you didn't think this through. This is your punishment. So I thought she'd sort of learned her lesson. I kind of anticipated that's what they were going to do. And then they have, like, that Council of the, the Seven Eves. Mm -hmm. that's the, you know, are we going to make this work or are we just going to wipe out humanity, which we need to talk about in a moment. And she starts talking. I'm like, no, she got nothing. She's still, she's still useless. That's how I felt. But mm -hmm. so everybody's back together and there's like nine people left. Eight of them are women. One of them can't have children. Seven of them can. Now we've mm -hmm. introduced the seven eaves. Oh, and the, the ninth is... Doob. No. Yeah, it's Doob. It's not Doob. He dies He's like... He's dead. I thought he died after. Oh. I thought he... he Because they've gotten yeah, to the space right. rock, they've gotten to cleft, and they're kind of going, okay, everything's settled, everything's safe, we can start talking about what it is going to be to establish a thing. I thought he died, you're, like, right after that. He's de right. He's dead. He has cancer. Everybody knows he's it's just waiting to die. And he takes him out for this. Dina takes him out on a spacewalk and he dies shortly after. Yeah. So, okay. That's either like right before or right after. You're right. So the council. 
Yeah. So now we're at the Council of the Seven Eves. There's eight women left. Seven of them can have kids. One of them can't. Mm-hmm. We've got our Seven Eves. We're at the end of part two of the book. Yeah. But part of this is them sitting down and negotiating because they can genetically manipulate, enhance, and remove (sighs) traits out of their kids. Yeah. They are deciding the entirety of the future of the human race for these seven women. Mm -hmm. How did you feel in this moment? Sitting there as they're discussing what they want to do and keep effectively as a human race with genetic manipulation. I felt frustrated for uh, Aida. Okay. Because I didn't think... Now, I... I, I, I blah, can't get it. Aida. Aida, whatever her name is. They've introduced her as the bad character, or the bad guy character. She is the one who was hardcore cannibalism. I want to kill everybody. I want control. She's a psycho. Right. And they introduced her earlier on in all of this as kind of a wingman to Julia. Yeah. Who then just became even bigger and wilder. Yeah. Definitely. And there's another wingman to Julia who's uh, also the 70 of Camilla. Camilla, who, yeah. Who's the gentle and gracious one who, you know, has experienced trauma at the hands of society and doesn't want that. And is abandoned by yeah. Julia. Right. And sort of, she's she's sort of a, a broken person. So, yeah. why, real quick, we'll, we'll give the seven eaves. How about that? You have Dinah, who you followed through the whole book. She's a scientist. She's the one whose family died. Or, well, Mountain family, Morse code. Uh, you have Ivy, who has helped run Izzy and been there from the beginning. And she features in and out, but isn't like a main character through that part of the book. She's there. Yeah. She's sort of the support. Uh, you have Julia, who is the former president. You have Moira Crew, who is a geneticist and the one that's saying, look, I can... You know, what What do we want? We can do this. And she's one of the characters who they introduce in the book and then kind of let her cool off. You forget about her. And then she pops up again as, I survived. I'm a gen- geneticist. We can make this all work how we would like to. Mm-hmm. You have Tekla, who was the suicide cosmonaut mission, who did survive, was rescued by... Dina. Dina. And, Very bravely. Right. And she features heavily because she's a, a great character, written and Russian and, you know, security focused. Camilla, who is a wingman to Julia and traumatized by society. And Aida, who is introduced later in the book and just this insane character who wants to eat everybody. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. So, okay. I felt... That Like, humanity, hasn't humanity progressed far enough and seen enough crap? Like, we've, all of them have exper- have seen and experienced racism and things. I, w- I, it made me sad that they were setting up Aida's future progeny to be outcasts. Like, they all agreed that's what they were going to do, basically. That's what she wanted. And I just was... Like, come on, I, that was so sad to me that, that they were setting things up to be that way right from the get-go. Humanity never really changes. It, they're still racist. They're still xenophobic. They're still, they're gonna let all her descendants bear the guilt for her psychosis. I didn't, that made me sad. I liked everybody else's decisions, you know, basically... That was cool. It was other than hers. It was neat how they picked traits to highlight. I liked that. That was interesting. But I didn't like right from the get go. Right from that council, they were saying, "Yeah, we're cool with racism. Let's do this." I don't get. I didn't like that at all. Yeah, and that's rough. I and I wouldn't say it is racism as much as it's these are the stereotypical qualities that I want and. It, 
I mean, it, it extrapolates out because you zoom ahead 5,000 years and you see all of that and you see the divisions that are created because of the seven eaves, because of that, that moment, that council. And even to the point where you have a division of peoples on a, what did they call it? It was like a red blue basis, which was very, yeah. very much kind of reminiscent of communist and Western um, yeah, I guess ideologies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's not like Tekla wasn't on that red side. It was Aida's people who at the Council of the Seven Eves pronounces this curse on any of her descendants that, you know, you'll forever bear what is my stigma of being insane and cannibalistic. Yeah, I almost would have said, you know, maybe we shouldn't let her procreate. Honestly, I think they would have been OK, but they didn't know that. But they shouldn't have even let her procreate. But the great piece, and and this is where I, I really, like, Dina as a character was always, she was grounded. She was always practical. She grew up with minors. Yeah. And this is where I, I really enjoyed and appreciated that grounding of a character. Because as they're sitting there arguing and fighting over this, she just kind of quietly leaves, get in, gets into a space suit. <laughs> Goes outside and takes an explosive and sticks it to the window, taps the window and says, yeah, no, figure this out or we're all dead. There's eight people left in humanity. And she's saying, yeah. screw it. I will make us extinct if you keep this up. And she really thinks about it. She really, really does. It's not bluff. Yes. Yeah, well, and, you know, everyone gives her the thumbs up and it comes to an agreement and they're all good. And she's just sitting out there holding that chunk going. Do I really want to let them live? There's like 10 seconds left on the timer, and she's like, mm, mm, fine. <laughs> I know. There was definitely a part of me that was like, you know what? Just let it go. Let it go. Boom. Be done. Definitely sympathized with her for that. Yeah. But, yeah. After, after all the chaos and all the death and, and trauma that she went through, too. Right. And no, I, I didn't blame her a bit. And now, part of the interesting thing with the Seven Eves Council is how they each look and say, like Dinah saying, I want to, to bring a race of heroes. And Julie saying, I want to bring a race of thinkers. And, uh, oh, I can't remember which else she tied in with that, but empathetic individuals. And, you know, that plays out over the thousands of years because you time jump after this. You, you have the Seven Eves. And then you time jump into five, six thousand years in the future, whatever it was. And they're just beginning to be able to recolonize Earth. In that time period, you know, they, they've they figured out the genetics. They slowly built up the number of people that were on Izzy. They slowly built people back up. Slowly expanded what was their colony. Da, 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 da. And they call them the scarce years or the hunger years. And then they... Have gotten to the point where they have a ring around the earth. Things have stabilized. They're able to mine in space. And they're able to begin colonization and reseeding of earth. With that time jump. With that sudden introduction that earth is rehabitable. There's a lot of people now. Several million or billion in space. Whatever it was. How'd you feel? It was fun. It was a fun bit. <laughs> There was kind of too much for me going on to picture in my head very well. So I think I didn't picture it in my head correctly. But what I sort of did picture, um, it was very interesting. I liked the new characters that they introduced. I liked how different they were. I liked Kath 2 slash 3. Yeah. <laughs> Kath 2 was a Moiran and they can change. They like shift the epigenetically throughout their life like evolve yeah throughout their life which was really interesting like hormonally stuff happens that was pretty wild yeah that was i i was a little confused on that one but i get the concept they were going for but i was confused so i loved her suit thing that she flies that oh, was yeah. really bizarre uh i got the her plane was like a glider that she was a glider but i didn't understand how the big plane worked that everybody else fit into later. I didn't understand that very well. There was a lot I couldn't really picture, so my brain just went like blah, 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 but mentally, like picturing things, like, I don't know. 
Yeah, I... <laughs> it was hard to picture. Parts of it were when they did that time jump, where it was like, okay, you know, the her glider it was inflatable, she could fly it, and, you know, it, very traditional kind of idea and concept. But then the plane that they were flying around in, trying to search for uh, the sightings of, of people that they thought had come down illegally, but, you know, it turns out it wasn't illegally. We'll talk about that in a minute. That Some of the technology, some of that concept stuff, I was like, ah, no, I'm not quite getting it. That that feels like it definitely needs to be a Ron Howard movie. Just to help give some of the imagery, which I think would be neat. Anyway, one of the things that I I found incredibly fascinating, just from a social, sociological perspective, mm-hmm. they have, what are they called? They call it the Epic. Yes, I loved that. Which, the epic is, in part two, they, they kind of hint at this at a few different pieces, but in part two of the book, there are cameras everywhere recording yep. everything. So yeah. nothing is hidden. Everything's documented. Everything is documented. And so now, five, six thousand years in the future, they have Everything, you know, the Council of the Seven Eves and Dinah being on the outside saying, yeah, maybe we'll keep it. No, they have that. They have all of the best and worst moments of that whole journey and they watch it continuously. Which explains a lot about the stigma sticking. Right. Which is fascinating. You know, you post it online and it never goes away. Well, that's what this is, where it's okay. They live their lives in a literal bubble, and every decision, good and bad, for generations, didn't go away. Because each individual identifies by the original Eve that brought their race into existence. Mm-hmm. And so they look and they're like, yeah, I'm a, a Dynan. I'm a Morin. Uh, Mor- oh, I can't do it. Mor- Ugh. Moirin? Thank you. So all of that plays out. Da, 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 da. It's a neat little sociological asp- aspect and experiment that they extrapolate out. Da, 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 da. How'd you feel with them trying to chase down the alleged illegal settlers? It was interesting. I think I was sort of ready to be done the book by then. Okay. Really, really, really done. But it was interesting. I liked the psych. Mm. The, the girl sonar tax law. Yeah. <laughs> I loved her. She was so funny. So you liked how they found other people. How you found out that, oh, wait, the um, Di- <laughs> Dinah's relatives actually did survive in the mountain for years. And- kind of. Yeah, I liked that. But I was I didn't really like that. They find each other and it's all, they just killed the professor and his friend so suddenly after building up this character for a little while and talking about how much everybody loves him and now he's dead. Like, come on. Everybody dies. I was frustrated. Nobody had plot armor. Yeah. See, I thought it was neat how they tied in, oh, like even the Submariner people and Ivy. I liked that. We forgot to talk about all that. There's there's a lot there, too. Yeah, where she's engaged to the submarine captain who nukes Venezuela, but also he leads a group of people in submarines to survive through the, the hard rain. and That was very interesting. I liked that, too. I liked that. Yeah, and what's neat is it's just, you know, right there at that end, you have you have the reflection of, oh, we were so focused on us, we never considered that there might have been other projects going on. To try and save humanity. Which is just an interesting little point on that selfishness of what is perspective. and Yeah, like who wouldn't try to survive? Right. You know? Like obviously everybody was trying to survive. So. It, it was an interesting little end to it. And they yeah, end you at a, a point of conflict. But humanity has survived. Yeah. It kind of makes you. It leaves you with thinking things are going to be okay. Ish. But yes. <laughs> Ish. Things will basically be okay. Right. We'll still go on. We'll still be humans and fight and kill each other and da 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 da. But it's okay. Yeah. All right. So that's finished. Book's done. Seven Eves is yep. done. We're calling it done. Yep. 
Bye bye, Seven Eves. It was a big book. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> so, no. real quick, I proposed the idea last week of not this book round, not this book round, but the next book club. Letting Becky, crazy book lady, pick. Right. Yep. Are you up for that? Yep. I think that'll be fun. It will be fun. That'll be a good episode. Yes, it will. But you have this pick. You have a choice. I'm going to make you choose. Oh. Between a nonfiction book that we did discuss some under the banner of heaven uh, by John Krakenau. He wrote Into the Wild and Into Thin Air. He's a really good investigative journalist kind of guy. He's, he's a good writer. Very fun to read. Um, and I think this is like a murder mystery type thing. Or it's about uh, an investigation in something about Mormons, but I can't remember exactly. So that's the nonfiction book. Or you have fiction. And it will be a genre-bending horror sci-fi. 600 pages. We're doing this in October, aren't we? Let's do the fiction. Okay. What's the fiction? It's called The Wolf's Hour by Robert McCammon. M-C-C-A-M-M-O-N. Hmm. And this is a writer I've been wanting to read for a while because he's compared to King. His, uh... His book, Swan Song, is compared to, to The Stand a lot. <laughs> what? Sorry, I just read the beginning. Uh, okay. A werewolf is a British spy immigrant that is a top spy for Britain during World War II in 1942. <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> yeah. What? Okay. <laughs> it's supposed to be really good. It's supposed to be good, so I'm, I'm look. It's and it's my first Robert McCarran book, McCammon book, so I have no idea, but I, I, it's on my list of things that I want to read, and I'm on a horror kick right now, so I think we're gonna read this. Okay, well, yeah, we are gonna read this. You gave me the choice. I do want to read it under the banner, under the banner of heaven. There we go. Mm-hmm. That's been on my list for a bit, but what in the world did I pick? <laughs> werewolf spies in World War II okay whatever <laughs> it's like that just think of it as a grown up uh, that book you had us read about the beasts the mechanics oh yeah uh, it's kind of like that Leviathan Behemoth Goliath or alternate alternate, re- alternate alternate history alternate history ah <laughs> yeah, yeah. alright fine all right. <laughs> Werewolf spies. All right. Werewolf spies. It makes me think of, I can't remember if it was uh, Love, De- Love, Death, and Robots or uh, Black Mirror, where there's like a werewolf soldiers episode short. and That's oh, got to be Black Mirror. Is that Black Mirror? I'm really into werewolves lately. The Talisman has werewolves in it, too, by Stephen King. It's going to drive me nuts. What is that? Love, Death, and Robots. That's Love, Death, yeah. and Robots. Have you ever watched yeah. those? Yeah, some of them. Okay. I I enjoy them. They're dark. They're twisted. They're weird. Yeah. So. All right. So we're watching or er, reading The Werewolf's Hour. Yep. All right. Sounds good. You good? Yes. Entirely discontent with my book choice? No. <laughs> I, I'm picking. I'm picking. Oh. Sorry, you complained <laughs> a handful of times. It's too big. It's huge. I did. There were, words there were parts are... of it that were hard to get through, but yes. I overall, especially talking about it and remembering that second part, I really like it. I did really like it. I. So, yeah, when you, you get into the social stuff, and it, it's a good book. It is. It's just it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But I gotta go. Yep. Res- rescue people. Have fun. I will. So, all Talk right. Talk to you soon. Yep. Good talking to you. Bye. Thank you for listening to the 42 Podcast. 
please take a moment to like and subscribe. And if you want to join in on the conversation, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter to add your voice to the conversation. Thank you.